Hi everybody, Russ from the West End Network. Hope you are all safe and well, my friends. I generally do. Hope you're having a nice weekend as well. It's Sunday, the, the, yeah, the weather's okay. It's going to rain a little bit later on. Anyway, I hope you're enjoying your uh, your weekend. If you're new around here, where the hell have you been? Where the hell have you been? Uh, but if you are new around here, please give it a like, a bit comment, share, subscribe as well. If you have a, have a look down there, and if you've got like... If it's red, where it says subscribe, you're not subscribed. If it's grey, you're subscribed. You subscribe. So if you could do it, be grateful. Or maybe become a channel member and be entered into our monthly and weekly draws to win prizes every week. That's going to be starting uh, next week, I think. Um, got another episode of Hammers in Hot Water. Um, so we've been running and we started, uh, we had an episode last week with Savio, which was the first one on the, on the network. And people really loved it. So we thought we'd bring you some more. Um, so um, we're going to go well back. I think Savio was 2009-ish. Uh, we're going a little bit further back. We're going to go about 20 years back. No, about 15 years back to the mid-90s. Um, and we're going to talk about one man and one man only. This man. Marco Bloody Boogers. The Boogers man cometh. Not the boogie man, the Boogers man. So let me take you guys back, as lights do. It's a Jack and Norby story. So sit, strap in. Let us know what you think afterwards. So if we start right at the beginning of the this this Booger saga, um, the ninety nine no sorry the nineteen ninety four ninety five season had just finished. Um, it was our second full season in the Premier League, and we were sort of stagnating. We'd had two full seasons in the Premier League. Um, we'd finished in the lower third of the table. Both um, it was clear we needed reinforcements. And um, Harry went on a bit of a spending spree, to be honest. Uh, we made 11 signings um, between May 1995 and January 1996. Peter Shilton came in, Mark Reaper, um, Billich, Robbie Slater, Lazaridis, Steve Jones, John Harkes, Danny, Ili Dimitrescu, amongst others. Um, although we desperately needed that sort of that firepower up front to partner fan favourite Tony Cotty. Now, Harry had identified Marcus Stewart as the man who was going to get us these goals and he was going to be our main striker. Uh, he was playing at Bristol Rovers at the time, um, but unfortunately he came with a 1.5 million price tag, which was far too much. So Harry was basically little, he had little time and uh, little money to get this forward involved. So he opted to spend uh, 800,000 quid on Sparta, Rotterdam's forward, Mar Marco, Marco Boogers. He came a bit of pedigree, Marco Boogers did, to be fair. Um, he had netted in total 103 goals in 238 league appearances in the Dutch league. Um, and he was the third best player in the league that season with 15 goals during that season in the 94-95 season. And that's not bad when you think the likes of Littman, um, Ronaldo for PSV and Cliver were also playing their trade in that league as well as people like the De Boer brothers and people like that so that wasn't too shabby so he came a bit of pedigree although Rotterdam season was as probably as un uneventful as ours was that season I think they finished 16th uh, 14th or something like that as well so almost identical positions to us and he stood out because He'd scored so many goals, so, you know, potentially extra kudos there. Um, Boogers was actually believed to have a choice of clubs. Um, not just West Ham, but Napoli, Everton and Borussia Dortmund were all courting him. But he wanted to come to West Ham and chose West Ham because of the, the colours of the shirts. Um, so, you know, H was looking for this target man. He was looking for a guy to partner Cotty. Um, to have this sort of two up top, as well as buying Boogers and everyone else, he seemed. He also stumped up a quarter of a million for Ian Dowie as well, who was uh, a similar height to Boogers of 185, 186, something like that. Now, there were rumours that Marco Boogers hadn't been properly scouted, um, and they were initially denied by both Boogers and Redknapp until a few years later in H's um, autobiography. He revealed he actually just watched a tape a video of Marco's highlights, and that was enough to convince him to get him in. As I said, he was short on time, short on money, so he needed needed a striker in there. 
indeed Booger's did actually have quite a long-standing knee condition a knee injury which went undetected um in the medical so again it would have suggested that due to, that the uh, the due diligence wasn't sufficiently carried out before his arrival is fair to say um when Boogers arrived for pre-season, it was quite clear that Harry's idea of an imposing number nine pretty much evaporated quite quickly. Um, he was quite slender, not bulky as Harry had hoped. Um, when we spoke to Martin Allen, actually, he um, he actually who actually H decided to room Boogers with Martin Allen during pre-season. He even mentioned he thought Boogers was a little bit odd, um, which was quite a lot considering it came from the mad dog um and indeed harry spoke of boogers in a 2019 interview um saying right from the go the word go boogers his attitude stank he was among the stragglers at the back when we would go for a run he didn't want to work he was lazy and all the players took an instant dislike to him i suppose you would have you, you I suppose you could say he could play a bit, but he certainly was nowhere near as impressive as the video that <laughs> the video made out to me. What a surprise. A highlights video which didn't talk about the player's lack of interest in training and things like that. Who would have thunk it? Anyway, so as I said, Harry clearly wasn't convinced with Boogers. He didn't start the opening game of that season against Leeds. He opted for Dowie and up top with TC. Boogers came on as a second half substitute though. Um with the Hammers 2-1 down. He got a warm reception by the Alton Park faithful. He was the actual cover star on the Matchday programme, believe it or not. Um, he didn't really do anything noteworthy in his debut, to be perfectly honest. He saved that. He saved that greater impact for his next game, which was away to Manchester United. Again, Boogers was on the bench. Um, Redknapp opted for just one up top with TC up front on his own. Uh, and Boogers came on once again as a second half substitute. He was unleashed. And uh, within minutes of coming on, Marco set his sights on Gary Neville. He was attempting, Gary was attempting, uh, 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 I think it was Steve Bruce passed it to him. Quite innocuous, like reasonably sort of high ball. And uh, Gary was trying to high control this high ball when Boogers sprinted towards him and aided with the wet, wet grass, apparently, of Old Trafford, slid into Neville, threw into his standing leg, sending Neville crashing to the ground and a brawl erupted, including a noteworthy standoff between Julian Dixon and Roy Keane, which would have been interesting to see. Unsurprisingly, the referee, Doug McGallagher at the time, had no choice but to issue a straight red card. And you can see here how happy Andy Cole looks at that. And you'll see a young David Beckham in the background there, Gary Pallister. Um, I think Schmeichel was involved in there. Look at, look at Cotty compared to Boogers. You see the height difference. You see why H needed a, a bigger, bigger striker. So anyway... Um, Yes, so he'd been sent off, and uh, despite uh, Harry stating in the pre and the post-match interview that the tackle wasn't in Marco's character, he later agreed that he got what he deserved, and um, all things weren't rosy when it came to Marco Boogers. H said pretty soon after he arrived, I realised he he wasn't quite right. He didn't speak a word of English, and after a month, Marco's wife was crying. She was missing a mother, and we couldn't understand any of it. So there was always a, a even from the beginning this sort of strange relationship between uh, marco and england really by the sounds of it not just west ham so uh despite appealing the decision um marco received a four match ban and so rather than being dogged by the press attention that the tackle had all the back pages of all newspapers had it had the tackle and had headlines um and he was feeling homesick so he went back to the netherlands to be with his family and that's where the legend began the legend of marco boogers he went back to the netherlands with his family and then the match day announcer at the time and also the club's travel arranger two jobs uh bill prosser he received a call from a club call um reporter for those of anyone sort of you know no, no, no. club call was like the biggest um it was like one sort of the main football news agencies um a lot of the tabloids got their information from club call uh, and it was sort of, you know, a lot of it's on telly text as you can see um and basically the club call report reporter wanted to get an interview with boogers and he asked prosser where he was Prosser 
told the reporter he hadn't booked any flights for Marco. He would do all the flights. That, that was Bill's job. Um, and that he had probably gone by car again. That's what his actual words. He'd probably gone by car again, assuming gone by car back to Netherlands. This was misinterpreted by the reporter that he'd gone back to his caravan. And again, if you if you said it out loud, it does. You know, there is you could take it on a phone as well. You know, phones weren't weren't crystal clear, and they're still not crystal clear now, to be honest. If it's landlines and stuff, so you could see where the difference was. So you know, because of the prominence of Club Court at the time um being one of the main agencies it ended up being on the back page of, of the day of the of the sun particularly that barmy boogers has gone to live in a caravan that was the headline and obviously it come just after the all the debacle with the neville tackle so it sort of it, the narrative continued so he was always so he was tarnished with this gone away to the netherlands to live in a caravan that wasn't the case at all Boogers was struggling to cope with life in London. He did return after his ban, after his four match ban, with a doctor's note saying he was psychologically unfit to play football. Although publicly, it was the story was he had a sore stomach, and that's why he couldn't play. He did actually go on to make two further appearances for the club, both as a sub against Blackburn and Aston Villa. Having played just 44 minutes in four defeats, his reoccurring knee injury, aggregated, aggravated during training in December, put him on the shelf. After emergency server, uh, emergency, sur it's not survey. I just <laughs> after emergency surgery in London, um, Boogers went back to the Netherlands for rehab, and during this time, his son was born, and so there was nothing really keeping him at Lon uh, in London. He didn't want to be back in London. When Boogers returned to full fitness. Uh, he was loaned to FC Gron. I can't pronounce it. Gronigan, FC Gronigan, but his knee problems returned even further, and his actual um, contract, uh, despite the fact he'd played for Gronigan, um, he'd scored a couple of goals, I believe. Um, West Ham basically term mutually terminated his contract in the summer of 1996. He returned to the Dutch league, um, but never really managed sort of his goal scoring exploits that we had at Sparta Rotterdam. Um, he was at RKC Warwick. Dennis will, tip, will give me the pronunciations later, but never managed to reach his, these exploits. He scored nine goals in the 96-97 season. Um, then he dropped down a division to FC Volven, Volven, Volendam. Why do I do these series? Volendam, 25 goals in 51 games. And then he moved to his hometown club of SC Dortrecht. 66 goals in 128 games. Not a bad return, to be honest. One in two. Um, and he, he played many games there, over, as I said, over 128 games there. After a brief stint as caretaker manager in 2005, he then became technical director at the club. Um, however, he regularly fell out with the then coach, Jan Everest. Quite often they'd have a, have a public clash in the media. After he was relieved of his duties of technical director, I believe it was 2017, 2019, something like that, um, he went on to run his logistics company full time. Nothing to do with football now at all. And he now, uh, and is, the company is very successful. Um, they have a, a contract with DHL and it's become a family run business with his sons. And so, yeah, so the. And that's so that's it that's what happened to marco boogers currently running a logistics firm and he still doesn't want to come to my arms 11 he's probably the, he's one of the only people who've rejected me he's rejected me anyway i hope you enjoyed that little walk down memory lane it's quite interesting when you when you see how players have changed you know after they've left west ham but it's almost like out of sight out of mind with some players particularly the foreign based players because they tend to go abroad and you don't necessarily follow them and then they'll crop up on a tweet or a remember when um sort of you know bit of information on youtube or whatever so anyway i hope you found it interesting um we've got next week javier margas probably next week that'd be a good episode he's crazy he's crazy <laughs>
<laughs> oh dear. Anyway, if you're new around here, give it a like, give it a comment, give it a share, give it a subscribe. Or maybe you consider becoming a channel member. Uh, we like to thank all of our channel members after each one of my shows. So take care, everyone. Stay safe. Wash those hands. Stay lucky. Stay positive. Stay cheeky. Um, stay hydrated as well. If it's quite warm, enjoy your Sunday roasts. And uh, I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.